Hello and welcome to Games Act. We're talking about reboots, or rather, series that have been rebooted, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess there could be any number of reasons why they do this. Maybe a series is old and has been forgotten for about seven, eight, ten years. Or maybe they didn't like the direction the original series was going and they wanted to do something different. Let's find out. Yeah, we got some good examples. Prince of Persia is a cinematic platformer game created by Jordan Mechner that I had a lot of fun with back in the day. The game was released on way too many PCs and systems to count, but I'm playing the Super Nintendo version here. The bad guy in this game is the Vizier Jafar and he's taken the princess and locked her in a tower. He's given her an entire 120 minutes to make a decision whether to marry him or die. What a great guy. I don't see how she couldn't fall in love with this guy. You play the princess's love interest and you've been thrown into the Vizier's dungeons. The dungeons are full of traps, spikes, and the occasional enemy guards which you must fight after you find a sword. I've always had a great time figuring out each level of the dungeon even though you die about 100 times trying to progress. But to me, that's the fun of this game. Sure, the controls are stiff and take some time to get used to, but once you do, you'll find the game a lot more fun. The only thing I don't like about this experience is that you have to rescue the princess in two hours or less or it's game over. Thanks to a password system, it really makes it easier and you can nail down levels in a short amount of time. If you haven't played this game, please do, it's worth it. I said please, it means you have to do it. As time went on, Ubisoft bought the rights of Prince of Persia and really made the most of the purchase. In 2003, they rebooted the series and released The Sands of Time, which is the first game of a trilogy. This is the GameCube version here, but it was released on all major platforms of the time. I was a bit weary of the prince going into a 3D game, but after the reviews and footage that I saw, I bought it and I wasn't at all disappointed. You're following your father's army, and after taking out a city, you find the Dagger of Time. An evil vizier tricks you into releasing the Sands of Time from a huge ass hourglass. This was a mistake, as it turns almost everyone into monsters. You, a girl named Farah, the vizier, and a few others somehow didn't get the monster makeover. Now you're off with the girl to collect the sands of time and set everything right. The game plays really well, and you'll feel slight nods to the original game with lots of spikes and pitfalls. But Ubisoft added so much more, and one of the most fun new abilities is being able to run along walls for a short period of time. It looks totally ridiculous, but it's really fun to do and you'll do it all the time. Just like a lot of games of this era, you'll battle a bunch of enemies and do a lot of platforming and puzzle solving and then battle a bunch more enemies. Repeat this process all throughout the game and that's it. I know it doesn't sound fun, but actually it really is. Battling your opponents can get a bit boring, but it's usually over quickly and then you're moving on. The platforming here is some of the most fun I've ever had in a 3D game. I think it's because of the Dagger of Time. You see, if you mess up and fall to your doom, you can activate it and this rewinds time. You can rewind your gameplay back to right before you screwed up and do it all over again. But you can only rewind a limited amount of time, so use it wisely. I've got to say that Ubisoft did one hell of a job with the reboot of this series, and this is exactly how the Prince of Persia in 3D should be. If they make any new games in the series, I'll be buying them because they're a solid experience. If you haven't tried this series, do yourself a favor and play it. The game still holds up well today, and they're definitely worth your money. Devil May Cry on the PlayStation 2 from Capcom is pretty interesting. Supposedly it started as a game in the Resident Evil series, kind of like Onimusha. You can tell because there's an emphasis on exploring and finding things to proceed to another area in addition to fighting. You play as Dante, who's a dude with demon blood that's trying to get revenge since he lost his mom and his brother to evil when he was just a kid. The first game kind of seems like a clunky Onimusha and it's sometimes hard to get a bearing on your angle since the camera switches around so much. But there's still plenty of action here as you explore everything. Later games in the series like Devil May Cry 3 here focused much more on the stylized action. And I feel that the series is much better because of this. You've got sword moves that you can do and you get graded on how stylish you are and lots of other nonsense like that. You also have guns which work great on some enemies but not so well on others. This series even inspired games like Bayonetta on the Xbox 360. Overall, it's a good series that has its charms, but I never really got into the original games because I was always busy playing something else at the time. Yeah! 
But in 2013, the series was rebooted with DMC, like Run DMC. It was available on the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and the PC. This is the PlayStation 4 version here, which was released later, and of course it's way more cool because the PS4 has like good graphics and stuff. It literally is the definitive edition. It also has more content than the original release, and you can even get it on the Xbox One if that's your scene. Right off the bat, I gotta say that I like this game a lot more than I do the originals. Well, maybe except for Dante himself. In the original games, Dante looked cool and he definitely stood out with his white hair and his red jacket. This guy looks like an average college douche who probably talks the entire way through a movie in a theater. There's a nice homage to Dante's original look early in the game, but new broski Dante won't be having any of that. You can get a costume that makes him look more like the original Dante though, at least here in the definitive edition. Gameplay wise, it's not tremendously different than the original games, but it feels a ton more responsive to me. You still won't be using your guns much, but they have their uses. One thing that's new is now you can modify your weapons, so to speak. Holding the L2 button gives angelic powers and holding the R2 button gives demon powers. For example, if you hold the R2 button and attack with your sword, you do a much heavier blow to your enemies and can even break shields. And holding L2 gives you a scythe and lets you attack very rapidly. You can also use these with the gun to pull far away platforms closer. The angelic power of the gun lets you swing with a grapple. These modifiers can even affect your jumping ability. You get each of these additions pretty much all at once in the game. The biggest challenge with these is trying to keep track of all the different button combinations as you often have to switch between them rapidly. And once you get the hang of it, it's really fun. But don't put the game down for six months and expect to pick it back up and get right back into it again without relearning everything. Overall, the game is extremely stylish. I love the giant taunts that are written on the environments like kill him or whatever. It's all very cool. And I really like the graphics everywhere. There's not much to say about the music other than it fits, but after powering off the game, I can't remember any of it. Kind of like the original Devil May Cry games in that sense. But overall, the sound design is really good. Now, I've got to say that I haven't played the HD collection of the first three games on the PS3, and I haven't tried Devil May Cry 4 yet, but I find this one to be excellent. Definitely worth the $10 I spent on it, and I recommend it to anyone who likes hack and slash action. Just as long as you can get over Dante being different from the original series anyway. Ah, Tomb Raider. This is the PlayStation version. How I love this game back when it came out. I still like it today, but back then I was infatuated. It was refreshing to have a girl protagonist and Laura was great. Yes, that's how us Americans pronounce her name, Laura. At the time, she looked good and she was strong and confident in her Tomb Raiding skills. After learning the slightly strange tankish controls, it really took off and I wanted to explore everything and everywhere. I wanted to see every nook and cranny of this game and find every secret. The thing that I liked most about this game is that it's heavy on puzzle solving and light on fighting enemies. It felt so good figuring out a puzzle that you've been working on for a long time and advancing to the next area. There's not a lot of music in this game and it really only plays at special events like finding a new room or when enemies appear. Fighting enemies was pretty easy once you got the hang of dodging them. Just keep your guns blasting and before you know it you're back to exploring. I always had mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, music would have been a nice addition for ambiance while playing. On the other hand, no music made the worlds that you were going through feel much more lonely and real somehow. As I played this game for the review, it struck me how barren everything is. Just a few relics laying around here and there and a few nice textures on the walls, but that's pretty much it. Still, I just loved the experience and wanted more. In 2009, Square Enix bought Eidos Interactive and one of the best things that happened as a result was a reboot of Tomb Raider. Crystal Dynamics developed the reboot of Lara Croft. After not liking the majority of the later installments of the series, I was a little bit hesitant to give this title a try. But I'm glad I did because it's one amazing game. This is the PlayStation 3 version here. It's great since it kind of starts over and Lara is just starting out and figuring things out for herself. 
She's a total noob at this, and as the game progresses, it's great to see her become stronger and trust in herself that she can overcome all these obstacles in her way. And there's plenty of obstacles. The main thing that you'll notice is that Laura controls really well. Gone are the tank controls, and she feels and moves naturally. I love how this game plays. It feels more like you're trying to survive instead of just hunting for relics and tombs. But make no mistake, relics and tombs are still a huge part of this game, and if you're like me, you'll want to take your time and search all over for hidden items. The tombs are great and offer some pretty crazy puzzles to figure out. It's a lot harder to find everything here as the worlds are just so lush and a lot bigger so it's easy to overlook areas. Still, I could just spend hours in one area just looking for hidden gems. Did someone say hidden gem? Well, I No! Get out of here, Metal Jesus! Not that kind of hidden gem! This is our show! Anyway, at first, Lara is without any weapons. Right from the beginning of the game, she's being hunted by a strange group of people. Not long into the game, you get a bow and arrow. This is actually one of my favorite weapons. As you earn experience in salvage crates, you can upgrade this thing to be super powerful with grenades and fire tips and many more useful items. It's an all-around great weapon, and it's quiet. Of course, you do get plenty of guns along the way, and these are all great fun as well, and you'll need them when there's a lot of enemies on screen. The island that you're stuck on looks amazing. There's huge waterfalls, dense vegetation, and lots and lots of human remains. It does a really good job of conveying a sense of foreboding. It's beautiful and scary all at the same time. Again, music plays off and on throughout the game for special events, and a little bit here and there as you're just wandering around. I love this game even more than the original Tomb Raider, even though both are a great time. Are you a fan of the series? Let me know as I'd like to hear your thoughts. And we're back. Dave, did you get the uh, Xbox One Tomb Raider, Rise of the Tomb Raider? I did. No, yeah. That's awesome. I totally bought that. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was actually going to buy an Xbox One for Cuphead. I was just going to wait till that game came out, whenever it is going to come out. Mm. But since uh, Microsoft has an exclusivity on Tomb Raider, Rise of the Tomb Raider. For I'm like, now. As, at the making of this video. At the making of this video, yeah. yes. So I was like, heck, yeah, I want to play this game early. So I actually did buy an Xbox One partially for this game. It's a great game. It is. Very good. Anyway, we've got more to come, so let's check out some Ninja Gaiden. Everyone knows about Ninja Gaiden on the NES. That is, unless you've never heard of it. You play as the ninja known as Ryu Hayabusa who's out to find answers about his father's death and it all leads up to something much more sinister. The story is told through cutscenes that were amazing for an 8-bit cartridge game. The action is fast and unforgiving. You jump around slashing enemies and item crate thingies with your sword. You can also gain special powers from these items, but they have a limited duration. It got a couple of sequels on the NES, which were also really cool. It's a really fun series that's also known for being extremely difficult. I mean, not for me, of course, since I'm such an awesome gamer. In fact, I don't think I've ever died in this game. Nope, definitely never. And especially not on the first stage. In 2004, Tecmo released Ninja Gaiden for the Xbox. Now the game is a 3D action platformer with the emphasis on action. You still play as Ryu Hayabusa, but the story is all new. Now, producer Tomonobu Itagaki has been quoted as saying that these might be a prequel to the original games, but I'm just not buying it. Like the originals, this one is known for being damn tough. The controls seem laggy to me, especially since you need to wait for your animations to finish before you can input more commands. The camera was also programmed by someone who hates video games. Now, I wasn't even able to get past the first boss when I played it today, but back in the day, I remember getting pretty damn far in this game. I remember thinking that the first boss was definitely one of the toughest. If you're interested, try to seek out Ninja Gaiden Black as it has a lot of refinements and additional content. I was able to beat the first boss on this one without much issue. I don't know if that's due to a change in the game or if I just got more acclimated to it by the time I put it in. I played both games on normal difficulty. This game takes itself pretty seriously and there's lots of different techniques for getting around and killing enemies. You have a fast but weak slash, a strong but slow slash, and a block. It's all pretty workable as long as you're not surrounded by too many enemies. But you're going to need a lot of patience because this game is definitely going to kick your ass. 
And it's certainly a good looking game. The graphics are in progressive scan and widescreen and there's tons of detail. I like how Ryu has no reflection on the floor though. I mean everything else does. Hmm, maybe he's a vampire? But then again I guess so are all the other ninjas because they don't have reflections either. The music is old style Japanese stuff and it fits very well. Overall this is an excellent game, but you've got to keep at it, just like with the originals. Tomonobu Itagaki is a hardcore Xbox fanboy. As such, this was exclusive to Microsoft consoles for a while. But then Ninja Gaiden Sigma came out on the PlayStation 3. This one's a full on HD remake of the original. As you can see it looks absolutely fantastic, I love the visuals here. Itagaki wasn't involved in this one, but it's still a fantastic game. Some people say that there's less content in this one and that may be the case. Others say that it's too easy but honestly I had a slightly harder time with this one than I did with Ninja Gaiden Black. Still if you keep at it, you can do it. The camera still sucks though. Also they added some motion control nonsense where you shake the controller to power up your ninja magic which is kinda dumb. Ninja Gaiden 2 on the Xbox 360 takes everything and makes it 10 times better. They made it feel much more responsive and a lot more exciting to play. This was Itagaki's last game before he left Tecmo. The stages are super long, though they never get boring. It does seem easier than the previous game though. And while the camera certainly isn't perfect, it's not as bad as it was in the original. In Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2 some extra content has been added, but some minor stuff has been taken away, like tests of valor. This personally doesn't make a huge impact for me, but maybe it does for you? I guess it just depends on which controller you prefer, but both versions of Ninja Gaiden 2 are awesome. <laughs> Lastly, there's Ninja Gaiden 3. This is the Razor's Edge version on the Xbox 360. Honestly, I'm just not feeling this one. It plays decently, but they changed it around too much and it doesn't really feel like a Ninja Gaiden game anymore. I mean it's definitely hard, it's the hardest Ninja Gaiden game I've ever played so far. The sad thing about it though is that I don't feel like continuing when I die. And that is the mark of a poor game. There's some new techniques like sliding and even some cool gruesome deaths, but overall Ninja Gaiden 2 just blows it away. All that said, I think I do prefer the rebooted series over the original games. Now that's not a knock at the originals or anything, it's just that I've had more fun with Itagaki's Ninja Gaiden games than any others. What do you think, do you like the originals better or do you like the Polygon ones better? Here's Rayman, an action platformer released in 1995. This was released on many platforms of the day and you're looking at the PlayStation version. This is a great game, not only because it's a good platformer, but because at the time 3D was all the rage so it was nice to get a good 2D title. As you can see the game is just gorgeous to look at. It's loaded with bright amazing colors and well drawn backgrounds and character sprites. Rayman himself looks good, but it's still a bit strange that he has hands and feet but no arms or legs. Strange decision, but I guess it works okay. As you start the game, Rayman can't do anything except for walk and jump. As you progress in the game, you earn abilities that are super useful like being able to punch and kill enemies. Even without these abilities, the first few levels are a breeze since there's not much that can harm you. But don't get too comfy because the game's difficulty ramps up real quick like in before you know it you're gonna want to throw your controller in rage. That is if you want to try and collect everything in this game. Still it's fun and has some of the richest sounding audio from that time. The music is really good, but sadly the tracks are really short. I'm sure they did this because most of the levels were made to be short. Just when you start getting into a level, you find you're at the end. Anyways, this was a really nice treat back in 1995. Yeah! As you know after this, Ubisoft released Rayman 2 and Rayman 3 and they were both 3D. Great game, sure, but nothing beats a good 2D platformer. Again, Ubisoft must have seen this and in 2011 rebooted the series and went back to the good old 2D platforming with Rayman Origins. This was again released on every platform and I'm playing the PS3 version here. This was great and after seeing a bunch of videos of gameplay, I was wanting this game in the worst possible way. I would have killed Joe's cat for an early copy. When it did come out, it was everything that I wanted and more. 
The gameplay starts out very similar to the first game. You start out a total weakling and earn all your abilities as you progress. Again, it's kind of annoying, but it works out okay. The graphics, as you can see, are like crack for your visual senses. Every time I play this game, I'm still in awe at how beautiful everything looks. It's also lush and full of life, and it's everything that I've dreamt a modern platformer should look like. This time around, the levels are much longer and there's lots of little hidden areas for you to find. If you're hunting for all those little lump creatures to collect, then you're gonna need to find all the hidden spots. Collecting them opens new levels and new characters to play. I really like the ability to choose other characters as it keeps the game kind of fresh. Just like the first game, the music here is really good and has tons of character just like the game. And there's also multiplayer action. Get with your friends or like I did and played a bit with my daughter. It's great fun and gets pretty competitive at times. I'm really happy that Ubisoft went back to 2D with this series and I hope they do a couple more before probably going back to 3D. Play this game if you haven't, it's great! Yes, it's Altered Beast from Sega, released in 1988. We've talked about this one before, and even if we hadn't, there's really not much to say. You're brought back from the dead by the ancient god Zeus to rescue his daughter, who is presumably not quite as ancient. It all takes place in Greece way back in the days of yore. You power yourself up with orbs and become a different beast in each level to fight Neff, who also turns into a different monster in each level. It was ported to many different consoles. Most don't care or are indifferent to this game, but hey, I enjoy it for what it is. Flash forward to the year 2005 and we get Altered Beast for the PlayStation 2. This one was only released in Europe and Japan because it's so awesome. The first thing that you'll notice is that it takes place in modern times, likely the not so distant future. You play as a dude who has a chip inside of him which lets him transform into different beasts. Zeus is nowhere to be found. When you transform into a beast you get a gruesome cinematic of it happening. I don't know, seems kind of painful. I don't think this is something that anyone would really like happening to them. But you can change from human to beast and back again as much as you'd like. That is, as long as your green bar has some energy in it. You see, when you're in beast mode, the green bar drains. Killing monsters gets you more green stuff. If the green stuff runs out, you start to lose your life unless you turn back into a human. This usually isn't a problem, as there's plenty of green stuff left behind by defeated enemies. You can also farm it from monsters as a human if you want. Yep, you can fight as a human as well. Many areas are swarming with enemies and the passageway is blocked. Fortunately, you don't need to kill all of them to advance, just the ones that have a weird white mist around them. You basically spend the game running around, fighting enemies, and trying to find the boss. The boss fights are fun, but damn, how many different life bars do they need? Once you defeat a boss, you'll find a chip, and this chip will let you transform into a new beast once it's installed. You can choose which beast you transform into for any given situation. Overall, the gameplay is slow and honestly kind of boring. I like the idea behind it all, but there's just not much excitement to be found here. The camera's pretty bad, and there's some significant slowdown in spots as well. This is also one of those games where your character has to finish his animations before you can do anything. This makes turning around and targeting an enemy really tough because you're busy punching the air. The swimming controls as a merman are just awful, and you even have to fight enemies like this to advance. The graphics are dark, depressing, and don't feature much color at all, just like my commentary. There's really nothing that stands out about this game. The music is calm while you're human and overly dramatic as a beast, and none of it is memorable. I don't think that they should have modernized this game, either in playstyle or setting. It should remain in ancient times with a mystical setting and be more arcade-like and less depressing. I can see why it wasn't released in the US. there's some reboots for you. Well, I've got to say, Joe, I was watching your sword skills in Ninja Gaiden there, and, uh, you know, 
pretty, pretty awesome. good. A lot better than I am. I mean, damn, I couldn't even beat that stupid first boss. He blocks everything. No, you've been past that. I remember that. You probably got further than I did. I'm not sure about no, that, I'm but I sure remember you, you that did. game was stupidly hard and, you know, almost controller breaking hard for me. It is now when you go back to it after you haven't played it forever. Uh -huh. But you got for, further than mm -hmm. I did back in the day. I'm. I, I'm pretty sure. Okay, well, my so. memory doesn't go far, that far back, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what are some reboots that you guys like, don't like? What are some that you want us to check out? Mm -hmm. Let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. So yeah, Joe, I was thinking about our reboot episode, and does that apply to systems too? Because I was thinking the PS4 might be a reboot of the PS3. <laughs> oh, dumbass. It's a sequel. Four comes after three. Oh, that's probably right. You're right, dude. Totally. Thanks. However, the Xbox One is a reboot of the Xbox One. <gasps> so cheesy.